Welcome to the Grazing Grass Podcast, episode 13, where we talk with Jim Elizondo of Real Wealth Ranching. If you're going to hire a consultant or you want to learn from someone, be sure that that person has mud on his boots, has a ranch or farm, and actually has achieved success doing a commercial beef or dairy. You're listening to the Grazing Grass Podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers. On today's show, we have Jim Elizondo of Real Wealth Ranching. He discusses his ranches and what they're doing on them and the environment that they are in. Very different environment for each ranch. And he also talks about the four pillars of ranching. Before we get to today's conversation, if you've not subscribed to our podcast, please subscribe. Also, share this episode with someone you think might find it interesting. Also, leave us a review wherever you listen to our podcast. Jim, we want to welcome you to the Grazing Grass Podcast. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. I, I am. My name is Jaime Elizondo. They call me Jim Elizondo here in the United States. I've been living here in the United States for 10 years now. I'm an American citizen born in Mexico. Uh, I have two ranches over there. My father was a, grandfa- uh, a rancher. My grandfather was a, a big rancher. And I bought my first ranch in 1990. It's an irrigated 300-acre ranch near Tampico, Mexico, which is a very hot and environment with high humidity at sea level. Then uh, in uh, 1998, I bought a second ranch uh, in a drier environment with no irrigation, where we get more like uh, 30 inches of rainfall, but it can vary from 8 to 50 inches, depending on the year and the hurricane season. Um, I'm an agronomy engineer. I graduated in 1984 from uh, the Tech of Monterrey in Mexico, and I learned the conventional way, which I quickly had to change to a more uh, regenerative approach where I could dispense the high cost synthetic fertilizers, chemicals, and insecticides to where I could improve the soil, humus con- the humus content of my soils and lower cost. That's how I got to doing the beyond organic method since 1995 out of necessity. But uh, luckily I had experience gardening with uh, rabbits and uh, crops of gardens, and I knew how to make compost since I was 13 years old, and I knew how to grow crops without the use of chemicals because I wasn't allowed to use them. So all I had to do is change my methods to incorporate cattle and pigs to where they would do most of the work in regenerating the land and improving the production year after year. So you're using no chemicals or no fertilizer or right. synthetic uh, fertilizer? Not any fertilizer, no chemicals, and not even for tick control, which we have pyroplasmosis in Mexico, which is a big problem. Cows die from it. But I am using a entomopagin, that's what they call it, fungus, that we spray on the cows, and that kills most of the ticks. We need a passive immunity that means we need a, a, a small load of ticks to maintain the immunity at high level. And we need the immune system to function at the highest level. So we don't even deworm our cattle and their immune system and their genetics are able to cope, cope with that uh, lower level of attack by parasites, external and internal, to where we can have a large population of dung beetles which help bring down the horn fly population, for example. Very good. And what did you call that fungi? Entomopagin. 
entomo okay. entomopathogen pathogen fungus. In Spanish, it's hongos entomopatógenos. So in English, it will be entomopathogen patog pathogen fungus. Yes. And you spray that on your cows. Yes, Once sir. A year, every, four, every 14 to 21 days. Uh, oh, okay. The, so quite for often. Tick control, for tick control, because they become resistant to chemicals, uh, they adapt and they evolve. They need to spray chemicals every 14 to 21 days. And when they become resistant, yeah. every seven days. Uh, but we decided, I decided I wanted cows that were resistant to ticks and not ticks that were resistant to chemicals. <laughs> I think that's a great selection there. Yeah. What breeds of cows are you using, or did you, what kind of cows? Well, I started with jerseys. I have a dairy, oh, yes. a grave dairy, but jerseys will, will not last long in the, in the sea level tropics there because of the pyroplasmosis transmitted by the ticks and the heat, the high heat index. So I had to, I changed to uh, Australian Fish and Sahi wool, started infusing that, and that didn't work. That has too many problems because of uh, uh, low fertility being the main problem brought in by the both indicus in the breed. So then I, I changed to uh, Girolando, which is even worse. Uh, oh, I'm no. milking gear with Holstein, larger cattle that cannot cope with the heat and parasites. Finally, I I made the switch to tropical milking criollo, a native breed brought in from Nicaragua a long time ago, and they their, their roots go back to the when the Spaniards first colonized America, and they have African Bostaurus genes, which convey much higher resistance to disease and parasites and heat resistance, and they have the slick gene which enables them to uh, get pregnant even when in low body condition. So they were ideal for me. And now I am infusing Mashona breed, Mashona cattle, which are even from Zimbabwe, Africa. And I consult for the largest herd left in the world, which is here in Florida, in, in uh, North Central Florida. And they have an even higher percentage of African Bostaurus genes, which enables us to get better results. Very nice. Are you using those breeds throughout all your ranches? Yes, sir. Even here in the United States, in the, here in Tallahassee, where I am managing a 2,500-acre ranch, and in uh, North Central Florida, where I am consulting for another ranch where we have like 600 of those animals. Oh, okay. And are in when you talk about your Florida or Texas, are they dealing with the tick population like Mexico, like your Mexican oh, no. ranches? No, 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 no. No, the United States is free of pyroplasmosis. They have the ticks, but they don't have the disease. So the Mashona being very tick resistant, we don't have to do anything. The ticks just fall off because the blood vessels close down and the tick has no way to drop blood and falls onto the soil. You, you also mentioned pigs earlier. Are you grazing pigs? Not or... anymore, but in, in Mexico, I did. Well, my daughter did. Uh, oh, did yes. The, yeah, on, on, on the side, she had up to 100 pigs grazing. And that was a good business. I, I like it because it's very simple. When you have a dairy, a great dairy, it's a lot, lot of work. So you want animals that complement and not need, that don't need more attention. And pigs are ideal for that. Yes. Dairies do take a, a lot of attention. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I even had a, a 1,000 use of a hair chip. Oh, and yes. They, and they took more work and attention than the dairy cows. So I decided oh, yes. to sell them and keep the dairy cows, which was much easier than the hair chip because of the environment that is very high in parasites. And chip oh, okay. are, not, are not that hardy against internal parasites. 
Right. I, I find in my area, the hair sheep are, are super easy. But, yeah. but like you said, you have a different environment than I do. Yeah. I've been there in, in Oklahoma. I've seen them. Yeah, they do very well. Yes, they do. What kind of forages are your cattle grazing on your ranches? In Mexico, in one ranch, in the irrigated ranches, 100% uh, common Bermuda. Common oh, okay. Bermuda, with some uh, leucaena trees that we uh, copies with a chainsaw every year so they get the extra protein because it's high in protein in the winter when we are lacking protein. And the other ranch, the dryland ranch, is Medio Blue Stem, Aristatus decantum is the Latin name, and that's the one that can take best the long dry period, which is normally 270 days without rain. For your, your ranches, tell me a little bit more about your environment. You mentioned the rain. What? How cold does it get there? How warm does it get? Okay. It gets up to 110 or higher in temperature in the summer for a long period with high humidity. That puts the, uh, the heat index in the red where you can die from heat stroke oh, for a yes. long time. So cattle need to be well adapted. And I planted a row of trees every 100 feet east to west direction of Leucaena by seed with an old hill drill then 12 to 14 years ago to where now we have the, row, the rows of large trees and we have enough shade for the cows and the people. In the winter, we get shorter days to, to where grass production goes down to a third of what it was in the summer. And it, we get a frost every seven to 10 years. So it's not common to get oh, a frost, okay. but we do get low growth. So to maintain our high stocking rate, which is what determines profitability on a ranch, we have to have something to keep them in the, not, in the winter. And that's for us is stockpile sugar cane. I planted and oh, I okay. raised it once. I raised it once in the winter. Yeah. That gives us the highest amount of cow days harvested per acre per year. Oh, wow. What? I've heard a lot about stockpiling, but never stockpiling sugarcane. If you can harvest stockpiled sugarcane with cattle, you can graze any stockpile for it you want. Oh, yes. It's hard. It's hard and tough. Yes. And here in Florida, we uh, use mostly bahia grass, Paspalum notatum. And we uh, stockpile it for winter. Right now, here in uh, over there in Tallahassee, it has uh, frosted many times, going down to the 20s, and uh, with ice in the water and everything. So we grade the stockpile bahia grass with a protein minimum protein supplement, which is made less by having the calves cap in a the cows cap in a short and correct calving season in the summer. To do that, we need adaptive genetics. So we are creating a composite with Mashona and Red Devon and Angus. Why did you pick those breeds? We've already talked well, about the Mashona some. Okay, the Angus, they had Angus there and Red Devon. When I uh, observed them and rang them, I found that there were some very good Angus and some a few very good Red Devon. So I uh, selected them to produce bulls with the, the best Machona bulls we could find. And we have uh, very good Machona bulls there uh, that I had been selecting for eight years in North Central Florida. So I have a uh, good Machona genetics now. Yeah. And are you finding your composite working really well there? Really well. Much, much better than the pure Angus or much much better you can see them side by side comparisons i had videos on youtube well not on youtube but on um, on facebook on my page oh, yeah. uh, real world ranching and you can see them there oh okay and we'll put a link to that in our show notes so we can 
go there to view it. On your cattle, on your ranches, how are you managing them for grazing? Are you rotating them? How are you doing yes. that? Yes, we are rotating them uh, because it's irrigated. We in, in the irrigated ranch, and this a, a grazed area. We move them twice a day after each milking, in the morning and in the evening. And we usually do like a 18 to 22 day rotation in the summer. And we go to 35 to 42 days in our winters. Uh, please don't look at it as a recipe because that's what works there with irrigation. That's right. not what will work in your ranch. In the other ranch that is a dry land and gets a three months of rain, maybe sometimes one, sometimes none, like last year and this year. We yes. got a week of rain and that was it. Uh, we stockpile half the property, which we alternate every year. Oh, we okay. We use in the non-growing season, and we graze in the growing season. The other half to put on weight on the cattle. And then when we finish all of that, we go to the stockpile section, and we graze in a total grazing way where we take most everything with a protein supplement because it's dry and low in protein, the forages, mature, brown. Yes. Keep up the body condition, which is enhanced by frequent moves. All that is explained in the total online grazing course. Are you moving them on the dry land ranch twice a day as well? Four times a day. Which oh, is four optimal. times a day. Yeah. Yes. That, that's... Uh, a lot like Marcos Jeffers was saying about his ranch, that he moves them multiple times each day with automatic gate openers or on timer oh. solar powered, so he doesn't have to physically do it. I gave a course in Chihuahua with Johan Sitzman, and we had like 120 people attend. I believe he was there. Oh, yes, very good. Yeah. Now, on your your moves, are you running electric fence? Do you have permanent fence? How, how are you keeping them in place? I use a uh, permanent electric one wire fences. That is a 12.5 gauge high tensile wire. Oh yes. And then I further subdivide with a poly braid to where I can move them uh, four times or two times a day, depending on my needs. You have that the permanent electric wire with that high tensile. Yes. Um, how do you have that arranged so that you can do it with? Is it just your perimeter, or do you have some subdivisions that's oh, varying okay, sizes? Okay. Let me explain. The, the perimeter is barbed wire, five. Strands. Oh, okay. Because we have a, the national highway go to the middle of the ranch, so we cannot afford... Oh, have yes. a cow get out and have liability. The yes. interior, in, interior fences and alleys to, for milk cows to walk to water or to the milk shed, that's where we use the one wire high tensile permanent. Oh, okay. Fence. Then to further subdivide those long and rectangular paddocks, we use a poly wire or poly braid. But to protect the trees that I mentioned before, we use high tensile wire because the trees that I planted are leucaena and the cows will trip the bark off them and kill them. So they have to be. Oh, prepared. yes. Yeah. I learned that the hard way. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not familiar with those trees at all, but um, it sounds like the cows really like them. Yeah, but you know uh, honey locust? Yes. It's similar to that, same oh, structure okay. and same type of leaves that allow sunlight to go through. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. When I went to Oklahoma, I saw the honey locust, and it looks a lot like it, but without uh, the thorns, of course. It, yes, and, and honey locust uh, will spread and, and take over an area pretty good if you let it. It expands and quite greatly. Yes, if you let it, yes. Yeah, my, my neighbor will say, oh, don't plant that tree because if you let it, it will be 
a forest and then you won't have any grass. Well, the key word is if you let it. <laughs> yes. on your management. Yeah. Yes, you can manage it and keep it from happening. Yes. Sure. And especially if the cows like it that much, um, they can take care of that issue. You know, in our area where they did some mining, they reclaimed land with Cerisa lespediza, which a lot of people don't like. Uh, it does contain some talons that work out really good for small ruminants and internal par parasites. But you can manage that with grazing animals and not have the issues that everybody complains about. It comes back sure to that good. management deal. Just like tall fescue. Uh, people complain about tall fescue, but if you manage it correctly, it's the best stockpile forest you can get. So it depends on management and knowledge in your part. Yes. Um, sadly, on the knowledge part, it seems I learn something new every day. I guess that's not a bad thing, but sometimes it's things I think I already know. Well, you know how ranching is. You learn a lesson every year, and you become proficient after 50 to 60 lessons. <laughs> there we go. Yes. <laughs> so, so one day, one day I'll one be proficient. Day. <laughs> That's why it's, it's good to learn from other people and not repeat the same mistakes. Oh, it is. I, I agree with that. That's why this podcast, this type of podcast, help people to learn based on others' experiences. Yes, I... This podcast was started for very selfish reasons, so I can learn and be better. And I'm sharing oh, it with other people. <laughs> that's, that's very generous. Yeah. <laughs> so you're moving your cattle. How do you water them? Do you have a watering system in place? Can you tell yes. us a little bit about it? Yes. First, I went with uh, movable, portable water troughs and rubber mates and those types. Yes, but it didn't. That doesn't work very well with large groups, and I have their uh, groups of three hundred or, or more cows. So I went to ponds, and that didn't work well because we have clay soil to where they would go into the water and break the the boundary and make oh, yeah. a hole, and then they they would get stuck. Uh, and when we oh. got a hurricane, it would be a great problem. So finally, I went to concrete um, water troughs with a roof over it because of the heat and the algae growth with a oh, concrete okay. apron all around that is six feet wide all around. And that has worked very well. And I had to, uh, a friend gave me a design of a high flow bulb at low okay. pressure that is three inches wide and opens full flow to three inches. So even uh, all the cows drinking at the same time, they cannot bring the water level down with gravity fed from a pond that is with a siphon. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah. And is that, is your pond quite a bit higher on elevation or how much no, drop not, do you not have? No, really, there? it's like uh, five feet higher. Oh, okay. That's why I use this special bulb that with other bulbs, it will not work. You need yes. this type. Full flow. Full flow, three inch. It opens a three inch diameter. Oh, very good. And yeah. so is your pipe running there from your pond three inches? Yes. A three sir. inch pipe. Yes. It's a, a black hose, but this. Black. Three inch. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And that's the one that has worked for us the best over the years. I've tried all types. Do you have multiple of those concrete watering troughs set up throughout? I have one, two, three, four on that 300 acre ranch. Oh, okay. In the right area. On the four. And in the other one on the on uh, 750 acres, I only have uh, four also. They walk more over there because production is less because of the low rainfall. Oh, okay. Uh, at, the, at the irrigated ranch, I have a, a year-round stocking rate of two cows per acre. So that's a high stocking rate. Yes, it is. Yes, very high. What's your stocking rate at your dry land ranch? Okay. It's more like a one animal unit per two acres. Oh, okay. 
Very good. But right now I had I had to destock because of four years of drought continuous. When I say drought, I mean very little rain, not half the normal rainfall. Half the normal rainfall to me is very easy to to adjust. But when you get a five to six inches out of thirty, that's very difficult. Oh yes, I would think it would be. That's like in the that, that's like a desert, and it became like a desert. So I had to destock completely. I held on for two or three years, and then I had to destock. Oh yes. And then you stocked it back after you got rain. We haven't gotten have, rain. Oh, you still haven't gotten rain. No. no. <laughs> this, past, this past rainy season, we didn't get rain. Only one week. Oh, no. And not enough. No, no. Well, well, hopefully those weather patterns will change and, and you'll be go through a wet cycle. Yes. It had never happened in my life before, but it can happen. Oh, yes. On your watering trough and your electric fence, are you making your paddocks large enough that that's part of the the paddock, the watering trough, or are you making lanes for cattle to walk to to get to the watering trough? Yeah, I have uh, two lo- two long lanes yes. for the milk cows to get into the paddocks and to come back for milking, and those same lanes are used for the water trough, oh, okay. which are. Uh, they're uh, strategically located. Now, on those lanes, do you do you have anything down to keep them from getting muddy where they have a lot of traffic? What do you have down in the lanes? Yes. It's like limestone oh, okay. or lime rock that we had to put in the lanes. Yes. Yeah. That helps a lot because sometimes we do get hurricanes when we can get uh, 20 inches of rain in one day. Oh, yes. That's the tropics. Oh, you. yes. Lots of rain there. We, I was talking to someone the other day in the hurricane season. We used to get rain in the part of Oklahoma I am in from the hurricanes coming in through the Gulf of Mexico and hitting Louisiana or Texas, then the rain comes up. But this year, each of the hurricanes, they'd hit Louisiana and they'd head north. But before they got to me, they turned east and went through Arkansas. And and I didn't reap much benefit from them. I am very conscious of that. I have been driving through there after each hurricane hit in Louisiana. Yes. Oh, uh, and in Tallahassee, this year was a drought year for us. Normally, we get 52 inches of rainfall. But this year, it didn't rain in the rainy season. It only rained at, in September after the rainy season and not much. But with that rain, we were able to stockpile enough forage at a high stocking rate to be able to not have to feed any hay through the winter. And that's what we're doing now. Oh, very good. My stockpiling has not worked well this year. We we just didn't get an we went through a dry period. And typically for me, if I pull off those pastures early to mid-August, I have enough fall growth to stockpile fescue. And this year, we didn't have the moisture, so I didn't get the growth. I got a little bit, but not not near enough. It's very risky to wait until August, September to stockpile. Yes. I started stockpiling here in May. Oh, okay. And it, but it didn't rain until September. <laughs> but that was, that enough, was enough because we were not going to use it. Yeah. We're going to use it in January, December, January, February, March. And by then, we should have spring growth. And we planted a lot of no-till drill, yes. uh, bayou kale, uh, oats, wheat, and hairy veg, and uh, rye grass, and um, oh, sweet clover. Sweet clover does very well over bahia grass. Oh, okay. And they're coming up. We're getting more rain now in the winter than in the growing season. Oh, yes, yes. Jim, on our podcast, we have our famous four questions. It's four questions we ask all of our guests. Um, our first question is, what's your favorite grazing grass-related book or resource? I like André Boisson, Grass Productivity. Okay. Uh, I, I wrote a Regenerative Ranching, which I like, but it's more of a manual. The basics are outlined in... Andre Boisson, Grass Productivity. 
even though we have to adjust it to our different environment and economic situation than when he wrote it. But it's a good book. Another one I love is uh, Fertility Pastures by Newman Turner from uh, England. Oh, yes. 1950-some. And another one is From Grass to Milk by McKinnon from New Zealand, 1960. That's a very good book on economics. Oh, very good. I, I've i heard of those books, but not the last one, Grass to Milk. From Grass to Milk by McKinnon. You can get it online for free. Oh, okay. I will have to look that up. It's a good book. What tool could you not live without on your ranches? That's easy. A Kubota side-by-side, a diesel Kubota side-by-side. Oh, yes. That's a great tool. That's our quarter horses. <laughs> yes. Japan, Japanese quarter horses. We don't use horses, only those. Yeah, they they eat a lot less grass than horses do. Well, <laughs> uh, I like horses, I, but we're not allowed to use horses in that. Oh, way. yes. We, we used to have horses, but then we just didn't use them enough, so... We have a Kubota side by side. What advice do you give new farmers starting on this path of regenerative agriculture or as they're looking to to improve their ranch or farm? I would advise them to use low cost biological methods. If you're going to hire a consultant or you want to learn from someone, be sure that that person has mud on his boots, has a ranch or farm, and actually has achieved success doing a commercial beef or dairy before you commit to working with him or her. Very good advice. And Jim, where can others find out more about you? Well, we are on social media. We are on Facebook under Real Wealth Ranching. On Instagram under Real World Ranching, RW Ranching. Uh, our webpage is www.rwranching.com. And uh, we're going to put that into resources at the yes. end. And, uh, and we are offering the four pillars of Real World Ranching, which work together to bring real wealth to your land and harmony to your land, animals, and people. Uh, And can I say what they are? Tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, the first pillar is called total grazing, which is about the grazing management and the stockpile area, which is alternated every year. And it's a way to reduce cost by 100 to $200 per cow per year, which is very important in today's economic situation. And by doing that, we can increase the humus content the fastest. But to do it better, we require adaptive genetics with the correct selection. And that's the second uh, online course that you get for life when you buy it and you get a discussion forum in in all of our courses and a, a, a question and answer sessions and a, a group a Facebook group where we meet afterwards oh, so we can good. all uh, interact and improve our skills to where you are confident to do it. Uh, I'm like a coach in that. And uh, to, to have adapted, correct genetics, you need to learn how to create them because no one will sell them to you. You need to create them in your own ranch and produce your own bulls to the, mo- to the, the best you can. By doing that, you will have better animals that will take care of you instead of you having to take care of them. Then the the third pillar is called nutrition, where I explain how the rumen works and what to do for minerals, how to monitor your mineral program, and how the different forages like fescue or cool season forages impact the type of grazing impact the health of your cattle. And, and, and how supplements impact or not, and when you need to feed protein, and how not to feed starchy grains. And the, the fourth pillar is a short and correct calving season, and it will come with a bonus on no-till drilling for a species, and how to 
incorporate new and better species to improve your, the composition of them in your pastures. Very good. And then I will start. I, I want to do one about uh, starting from, from scratch oh, yes. for new, new, new ones. Yeah. yeah. Very good, Jim. Jim, we appreciate you coming on our podcast and sharing a little bit with us. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Did I forget to ask the question you wanted to ask? Now is the chance for you to ask your question. Go to the grazinggrass.com website and click on Ask Your Question. Complete the form and we will have a future episode where our guests are answering your questions. You just listened to the Grazing Grass podcast, helping grass farmers learn from grass farmers. We encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, share our episodes with others, and leave us a review where you listen to podcasts. Until next time, keep grazing grass.